Hello everyone and welcome to this new pipeline of popularizing STEM science and technology in 21st century US popular culture. My name is Erika Tiburcio and I'll be chairing this panel which due to last minute changes groups together the 3A and the 3B that are science representation and colonialism and TV representations of science and research. Our first speaker is Lucia Benet Ortega with the paper titled Neocolonial Gazing, Constructing the Figure of the Refugee in Richard Powers' Generosity. Lucia Benet graduated in English Studies from the University of Granada and has recently completed her Master's in English Literature and Linguistics. Her main research interests include post-colonial studies, vulnerability studies, feminist criticism, and critical post-humanism. She is currently a PhD candidate in North American literature and has been granted a Spanish competitive PhD grant by the Spanish Ministry of Education to carry out her doctoral research on Richard Powers fiction at the University of Granada. So, uh, Lucia, when you're ready, Great, thank you, Erika. I'm going to share my name. Okay, let me know if you can't hear me or if you can't see the screen or anything. So, um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. Um, special thanks to the organizing committee. Thank you very much for all your effort, all your time. And it's a pleasure being here today. So my paper, as Erika said, is titled Neocolonial Gazing, Constructing the Figure of the Refugee in Richard Power's Generosity. So before I go into the specifics of my paper, I would like to briefly introduce um, the novel to you and the reasons why I chose it. Um, I read Generosity around this time um, last year, and of course, apart from really enjoying it, what I really liked is um, the merging of science and literature, of science and narration within the novel. Um, the author of the novel is Rick Powers, he's an American novelist, and he, in his fiction, he generally approaches a range of um, technological and scientific topics, such as um, neurology, genetics, virtual reality, etc. And in these novels, usually the main character um, finds themselves um, estranged due to the rise of the information of the digital and the media revolution. In the case of generosity, the novel deals with the search for the alleged happiness gene. And it focuses on um, the main character, Tassa. Tassa is an Algerian refugee who seems to be excessively generous um, and full of joy, but who by the end of the novel becomes estranged, becomes alienated. The innovative quality of my um, research is a study of this novel from a post-colonial perspective, which remains largely unexamined, focusing on the Western social construction of the refugee identity. So in my paper, I argue that Tassa, the main character, is not recognized for who she is as an individual, but rather she is perceived and treated by everybody around her, firstly, in terms of what they think um, a refugee is, what it means to be a refugee, and secondly, as an empirical object of attention um, by the scientists and the media who try to reconcile the apparently contradictory experiences of post-colonial trauma and happiness. The objectives I thus sought out to achieve are the following. Um, firstly, I wanted to observe the characterization of Tassa as an oriental other within the novel. And secondly, I aim to observe and analyze how um, this characterization as an oriental other contributed to her construction of the refugee identity, especially in relation to the stereotypes and the racist premises that frequently accompany it. Thirdly, I wanted to understand how um, the colonial gaze functions in the novel, and especially how it interrelated to the discourses of the scientists and the media. 
Finally, I aim to demonstrate how there is a lack of unconditional hospitality towards the welcoming of TASA in Chicago at the university in the north. So in order to carry out my analysis, um, I selected a few basic works, the first of all being Edward Said's Orientalism. And he um, gave, he introduced the concept of the same name, which referred to a set of discourses, um, or actually it described the way in which a European culture created the set of discourses of the East, of the Orient, as a means of exerting control and exerting authority over it, thus managing and producing the Orient, creating a superior Western self, as opposed to its antithetical inferior Eastern of and this was very interesting um, to consider in terms of the dynamics of domination and control that are represented in generosity. Secondly, I made use of Baba's The Location of Culture. Baba asserts that colonial discourse is based on the articulation of difference, and in turn, difference relies heavily on the notion of fixity. Baba defines fixity as a mode of representation which conveys a rigid order, something that is always in place, but which necessarily um, must be repeated time and time again, which is what happens um, in the novel with the use of stereotyping and labeling, producing a fixed image of Tassa, a preconceived image of her, of course. With respect to the welcoming of Tassa in Chicago, it only seemed fitting to focus on the hospitality and the ethics behind it following um, Derrida. Um, Derrida defines hospitality as the right of a stranger not to be treated with hostility when he arrives on somebody else's territory. But Derrida um, identified an aporia within this definition. Derrida says that it is the master of the house who defines the conditions of hospitality or welcome and thus consequently there cannot be an unconditional welcome. With respect to my methodology I carried out reading of um, many extracts of the texts mainly focusing on the representation of Tassa and the perception of Tassa by her friends, by the scientists and by the media. So firstly, I started out my analysis by focusing on the notion of exoticism by Graham Hoogan in order to ascribe it as a characteristic of Tassa as an oriental other. And I also made use of Sarah Ahmed's notion of the stranger. Ahmed defines the stranger as the unfamiliar familiar. So the stranger is not somebody who we fail to recognize, but rather it's one that we have already recognized beforehand as a stranger. So it involves a certain recognition, a certain perception of preconceived notions. I also made use of several definitions of um, refugee, refugee identity, refugeeness by Naya, by Naya's also Roger Setter, um, to focus on the colonial gaze on self or the binary that is present in the novel, emphasizing that refugeeness is a social construction. Thirdly, I considered how historically the narrative function of the colonial and the scientific gazes have reinforced one another as a means of exerting um, control and authority over the global south. And following Mary Louise Pratt's you know, very insightful chapter on traveling and the gaze, um, I used it in order to um, establish this relationship that exists between the colonial gaze and the scientific and media discourses present in the novel. Finally, and as I have already mentioned, I made use of Derrida's conceptualization of hospitality, or rather hospitality, which is emerging of hospitality and hostility, because Derrida says that in every act of hospitality, there's an act of hostility as a result of conditional hosting. Now I would like to share with you some of the results or the, same, or the main ideas of my analysis. In the first three sections of my paper, I deal with the different um, perceptions of alterity that Tassar is approached with in the first half of the novel. 
incapable of reconciling post-colonial trauma and happiness, Tasna's joy is pathologized by those closest to her, her friends, revealing a neo-colonial superiority that perceives her as a refugee above all else. So discursive markers such as labeling and stereotyping um, constitute um, you know, these strategies of reinforcement of binaries and emphasis on who they think she is or where she comes from. This, of course, focusing on how she's different. In the second part of my analysis and the latter section, um, latter half of section three, I demonstrate how uh, the discursive markers that I've mentioned are rooted by the characters of the novel towards Tassa. So the visions of her are all part of, you know, a neo-colonial gaze that, per that pervades the novel. So it's from an orientalist gaze to a stereotyping and racist gaze to a paternalistic one, Tassa is always observed. She is always studied, played and it is this high vantage point which controls and depicts Tassa throughout and it's actually very interesting because um, this high vantage point, this colonial gaze or scientific gaze never focalises on Tassa, it always focalises on all the other characters in the novel. This in fact adds to her construction as a stranger because we as readers are as intrigued as by her alterity as the characters themselves are. So as I said in the latter half and second half of the novel, um, a scientific and media frenzy unfolds. There's a scientist in the novel, um, he hears about Tassa, about her happiness, her joy, her generosity, and decides that he wants to study her. Um, but of course, this scientist is presented not as objective at all, as he is supposed to be, um, because um, in every single case, Tassa's happiness only becomes relevant when it is contrasted with the traumatic childhood she has experienced, and which supposedly should render her incapable of any feeling of um, other than trauma, passivity, vulnerability, etc. In addition, um, the media play an essential role as well in sharing this fixed uh, stereotypical image of Tassa that, you know, the scientific discourse um, starts out in what, you know, um, the philosopher Han, the German philosopher Han calls a society of transparency through the media, um, Tassa's image and Tassa's whole life is exposed, um, which once again ties back to the Orientalist gaze, which justifies this frenzy, which justifies this studying, objective studying of Tassa and on account of on how she can contribute to science. And in the end, she turns into a culturally broadcasted image of the Orient. In addition, Tassa, this way, is characterized as not belonging. Um, so this way, her refugeeness and more generally her otherness um, is posited as a kind of threshold. As long as she remains a refugee or is considered as such, she cannot be unconditionally welcome because she is different. Finally, I'm going to provide you with um, an overview of the main conclusions of my paper. Um, Richard Powell's novel provides a layer, layered and critical approach to the consideration of otherness in our contemporary globalized society, depicted through um, a neo-colonial superiority which posits Tassa's orientalization and refugeeness, denying her singularity and assuming in her a vulnerability, vulnerability a passivity. Certain trauma. The function of the gaze as a whole is really important because it, it, it works on multiple levels. The scrutiny that Tassa undergoes undeniably ties back to the colonial gaze in which the Eastern other was placed in a situation of inferiority, of degradation, 
that simultaneously allowed the Western self to objectify, to consume, and especially to study the former at his whim. It is at this point that one realizes the unequivocal link between or in contemporary capitalist society, between the discursive practices of neocolonialism, scientific advantage, um, advances, and also media dissemination, and which Richard Powers makes apparent in his novel, rendering Tassa as an empirical object of attention and reinforcing um, this self other binary, this construction and representation, constant representation of Tassa within this self other binary, this Manichaean thinking. And furthermore, uh, my analysis of the different gazes sheds light on their role in the construction of reality through presentation, how, um, you know, repeat these labels of Tassa, repeating these stereotypes in the eyes of the American public in the novel creates a specific you know, pigeonholed identity. And in the end, you know, Tassa actually becomes very vulnerable to. And for this reason, the novel presents um, a discourse that um, apparently should be of hospitality, apparently it should be welcoming and, and accepting of Tassa, but in reality, it is full of stereotypes, it's um, full of limits of labels, um, which manifest a uh, hostility, which in the end, Tassa is unable to cope with. So, Thank you very much for your attention and I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you, Lucia. Okay, thank you very much. It was really interesting. Indeed, I have a couple of questions for you. So thank you very much. Great, thank so, you. <laughs> okay, so our next speaker is Indrani Dasgup. Gutpa with the paper Reading Science and Modernity, a Comparative Analysis of US Pulp and Indian Science Fiction Magazines from 1910s to 1930s. Indrani Das Gupta is assistant professor in the Department of English, Maharajan Agrasen College, University of Delhi, India. She is currently pursuing her PhD from the Department of English, Jamia Milia Islamia, in the field of Indian science fiction. Her chapters have been published in Routledge, Macmillan, India, uh, Card Books, and Bloomsbury which is forthcoming. While her articles have been published in several national and international journals, her co-edited volume titled Gandhi in Indian's Literary and Cultural Imagination is to be published by Routlet in uh, 2022. Das Gupta's specific areas of interest include genres like science fiction, popular culture, detective literature, Victorian and modern British literature, sport culture, body studies, and border studies. She is also the nonfiction editor of Mithila Review, an international journal of science fiction and fantasy. So, uh, Indrani? Are you, I, are you yeah, yeah, I'm here, only that my, you know, net is like, you know, a little bit unsettled. I don't know what's going wrong. So I hope you don't mind if I just switch off my video, if that is okay. Okay. I'll switch it on later when the question answers begin. Okay, so, okay. Yeah. Uh, you can share your presentation. Yeah, as soon as, you know, the net connection, you know, stabilizes, I will switch it on. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank go you. On. Thank you, Erica. Thank you so much, the organizers, you know, for, you know, including me in this panel. So I'm looking forward to, you know, listening to your feedback. So here I go. My paper is titled Reading Science and Modernity, a Comparative Analysis of U.S. Pulp and Indian Science Fiction Magazines from 1910s to 1930s. The story of the growth of science fiction in the early science fiction magazines of U.S. and vernacular magazines from Bengal and Hindi heartland during colonial India charts the rise of highly inventive and in, in, uh, innovative genre, 
These magazines facilitated in making accessible and popular variety of scientific technologies and diverse scientific experimentation to common human consciousness. Simultaneously, it also highlighted the continual interactions between human societies and scientific attitudes, and one which played a crucial role in fashioning modern consciousness. Since the early 18th century and by the mid 19th century, the narrative of science and technology has been closely inflected with the po political and cultural denominations of modernity. As Joe Kane rightly suggests, wherever modernity is or was, we seem certain science is somehow intimately associated. The very idea of modernity emerges in its close implication with how science was practiced, imagined, speculated, and narrated. This desire to capture modernity via its representation through scientific discoveries, technological postulations, and experimentations and speculations sets us on various trajectories whereby science invariably became a part of our everyday consciousness. And it is amidst these momentous changes that we see the growth of science fiction in the magazine cultures of the US and far away in colonial India. American science fiction's emergence in 1926 with Hugo Gernsback edited magazine, Amazing Story has been duly documented in science fiction several histories. While Britain saw the first rudiments of this popular literary genre in both novelistic and short stories published in different periodicals, John Cheng and Mike Ashley reads the emergence of science fiction in America as located in pulp magazines and periodicals published during the interwar years. Cheng reads science fiction's publication in America as marking shifts in industrializing and modernizing impulses and as a cultural phenomena, quote, that imagined, celebrated, and considered modern science, unquote. Interestingly, a thousand miles away in eastern and central parts of colonial India, Bengal, and United Provinces areas during the times of you know, the British rule, science fiction narratives were also being written and consumed in periodicals and magazines from 1870s onwards. As Charu Singh notes, vernacular science periodicals in India emerged as a key medium for building science literate publics in colonial South Asia. In both these culturally and politically disparate magazine sites, vernacular Indian science fiction magazines and US pulp and early science fiction magazines, science emerged as the central idiom to configure multiple societal frameworks like politics, culture, economics, and history. This paper seeks to discuss this fascination for periodicals and magazines devoted to science fiction in America and in colonial India from the late 19th century and early 20th century. So the questions that arose you know, from this you know, cross-culturally, what are the kind of cross-connections and overlaps that can be drawn from these disparate sites? In what ways do these early science fiction narratives printed in Bengali, Hindi, vernacular magazines, and American periodicals comment on modernity? The idea of a continuous recurring monthly publication of science fiction stories suggests that readers were interested in reading such stories. So what kind of readers were targeted by these American and colonial Indian magazines? In what ways do these readers facilitate the rise of science fiction? What kind of thematic concerns were enunciated in these science fiction magazines? Engaging with this paper as a thought experiment, I wish to draw a conversation between US science fiction pulp magazines and few colonial Indian magazines published in Bengali and Hindi vernacular languages drawing inspiration from what Mike Ashley observed that no country has developed its own body of science fiction writers without having a regular science fiction magazine. And the majority of the leading science fiction writers throughout the world learn their craft through the science fiction magazine. This paper participates in an interactive dialogue in knowing and enhancing our knowledge via the lens of scientific modernity. Through this comparative analysis, the paper discusses these pulp science fiction magazines as crucial to the narrative of modernity, industrialization, and colonization. So in this paper, I will seek to develop a conversation with the issues that I found you know, between you know, the Bengali Hindi uh, science fiction magazine culture and with that of the US pulp uh, science fiction magazines. I'm just avoiding the long history of these, the overview of these magazines and periodicals because of the paucity of time. 
The rise of American science fiction emerged in the wake of grappling with the idea of science and its multiple incarnations. The idea of science acquired, as Brian Stableford states, its modern meaning when it took aboard the realization that reliable knowledge is rooted in the evidence of the senses, carefully sifted by deductive reasoning and the experimental testing of generalization. So we see the Eurocentric and the American US science fiction magazine, they base their understanding of science, technology, and modernity on empirical knowledge based on facts and rational frameworks, while the Indian science fiction magazines, you know, base their knowledge of science as inextricably linked with Western forms, institutions, and progressive practices, however, a science that emerged elsewhere. As Kennedy said, the manifest embodiments of modern modernity, science became imbricated with a sort of obfuscation of native cultures. George Basola described this transmission of science from the West to the East as a transmission from the center to the margin, which ensued in multiple phases. And this scientific diffusion continued until the far-flung colonies could manifest themselves through the scientific institutions and techno possibilities that underscores the metropolitan imperial centers. So if we read, understand, you know, science fiction within the Indian colonial science fiction magazines, scientific tools, ideas, technological epistemologies became imbricated in a kind of response, a response underscored by the natives understanding of science through the framework of imitation, assimilation, adaptation, versions, digression, exclusion, denial, and subversion. Take this further. When we start reading, you know, the US Pulp Fiction magazines, we realize that they are, you know, constantly thinking about these, you know, the shared concern with pluralistic articulations of modern through its refractions with scientific attitudes, innovations, and the interplay of fascinating narrative devices capable of opening up the imaginative frontiers of space and time. The growth of these early American science fiction magazines occurred at the backdrop of public's fascination with various forms of scientific development. As scientific modernity pushed the epistemological boundaries of human imagination while simultaneously manifesting numerous changes in how human civilization used and were exploited by such technological schemas, these early science fiction magazines functioned as a significant tool to cover the, uncover the practices of developing technologies of communication, as Mike Ashley said, which Frederick Kittler identified as mechanization takes command. This mechanization takes command is also very much visible in the Indian science fiction magazines as written in, uh, the magazine's name was um, Balok. Balok means child. And this magazine, you know, there is a poem. I want to read out this poem. Clean streets, garbage less, lit by rows of gaslight. The full moon has come out. It's no longer night. Flower mills, jute mills, cloth and brick mills. Machines that dig out water and make landfills. Elephantine machines make a road a day. Pranam at the feet of machines. Town and country have become twins. This poem is titled as Kolkata Bornon, uh, the earlier name of Calcutta. The poem describes various factories as having been established in the vicinity of Calcutta, the metropolitan center of the East, the colonial East, which had dynamically changed the spatial and spatial contours and boundaries of the city. These industrial transformation and accelerated rhythms of modernity blur the boundaries between small towns and cities, as is evident in the lines where towns and cities become mirror images of each other. Simultaneously, the spatial redesigning in initiated by the establishment of various industries like flour, flour mills, jute mills, and etc., emphasizes the muted role of nature within the space of the mechanical city. Here, the character of natural light has also undergone a mutation, with connotations of romance and mystery now being linked to mechanical light. Science now functions as a material symbol, an instrumental tool with specific functional values felt and experienced by the colonized at both personal and public levels. While underscored as a salutation to scientific energies, 
the poem's use of the Bengali word pranam, which means respect, plays to multiple tunes and registers. At one level, it suggests veneration for scientific tools and the features of rationality, espousing reverence for the universalizing propensities of scientific epistemologies and thereby inaugurating science as the new nature. At another level, the multiple scientific developments initiated in Calcutta invokes a kind of a crisis where the speaker finds himself at odds with the changes taking place around him. In its very adoration, the speaker finds himself distanced and alienated from the seductive and enchanting charms of science. The vernacular linguistic inflection of pranam asserts an ironic stance towards the icons of progress epitomized by factories, machines, and the birth of electricity. This poem together allows us to see that in the Indian science fiction magazines, which were being developed in periodicals like Palo, Sandesh, Mocha, the colonial ideology, though it was associated with icons of improvement, tools of empire, the tentacles of progress, it was also found to be you know, one which distanced and you know, alienated the natives. Even though they were institutionalization of Western science that was being established like the Asiatic Society, the Hindu College, the Calcutta School Book Societies, which were you know, disseminating knowledges pertaining to mathematics, chemistry, anatomy, and geography, yet simultaneously, all of these were showing that science was a form of oppression and exploitation. Coming back to the US science fiction magazines, particularly the amazing stories, which was published first in 1926 in Gunsfact, he wrote that amazing science fiction stories, which was published in 1926 and science wonder stories was published in 1929. These stories catered to a scientific bent of mind, those who could understand and control the machines and those who could not. These people who could you know, control the machines they made possible a technological sublime by the superior imagination of an engineer or a technician who could create an object that could overwhelm the imagination of ordinary men. 20th century brought home to us in the US Pulp Fiction magazines, the man-made technological marvels instead of bothering about the role of divine creation. Simultaneously, testifying to the changes inaugurated by these scientific technologies, dramatized what Paul Alcon stated as diversifying our perceptions of science. If most of Gernsbachian edited stories sought to attest to a myth of technological mastery, in Bengali and Hindi science fiction magazines, there was a constant political speculation about it. As Charles Singh says, Western science was made possible in these magazines like Sondesh, Vigyan. However, while Girls Back sought to dramatize a science of scientific based experimentation and innovation within the Indian science fiction stay, you know, stories, Indian science fiction magazines, wonder was often inflected with a notion of sarcasm and a political dissent. Even a sense of wonder is apparent in these Bengali Hindi science fiction stories like Shokha, Shokha means friend, Mochak means beehive, Sandesh, which means both a sweet dish and a message, a public message. This was not the dominating strain at all. Girls Back Amazing, uh, Amazing Stories was also concerned about defining the genre in the kind of, you know, the names that it had espoused from scientification to science fiction. However, within the Indian science fiction stories, we see the science or scientific technology became a space for multiple mobilities. These spaces or mobilities in their dynamic orientations foregrounded a cross-cultural, intercultural exchange that rejected colonial pedagogical sciences consolidation of identities and significations. Even as you know, new movements erupted through all these science fiction reformist magazines like Soka and Balok and Sondesh, with you know leading to you know young Bengal movement led by Henry Louis De Rosio and the Brahmo Samaj by Raja Ram Mohan Roy, they were also trying to tell us that science here did not function as a mode of an all-encompassing language. Rather, science became a language where idioms genre and styles of the colonial vernacular moment materialized as the outcomes of a creative translation. It is this creative translation, I claim, 
which informs and shapes Bangla and Hindi science fiction Bengali magazine cultures. And it is this which leads us to, you know, creating of and creating and encompassing different and multifarious scientific possibilities, wherein colonial science is revealed within the structures of pedagogic dissemination. Moving on further, in Gersbach stories, we see the possibility of the role of the readers through the definition of, you know, different definitions that erupted by scientification or science fiction. We see science became, for the fans, a generalized toolkit that allowed one to have one say, to apply general technical skills to any area of culture. Even as science was contested, yet it also allowed communities of practice to emerge. Unique, you know, uh, unique kind of relationship emerged between the author, writer, then the publishing market, and it was characterized by a highly interactive relationship among its all its authors and the readers and these fans in the early days of these pulp science fiction magazines of US. Within the Indian science fiction state, there also emerged a new kind of a readership. And here and I quote one of the best stories that was, and that still continues to be one of the best stories in within the Indian science fiction magazine. And this is the diary of Professor Hishuram Hushyar, written by Sukumar Ray, the father of Satyajit Ray, who won the, um, the Lifetime Award, Oscar Award. So I'm quoting one of his lines here, the first introductory lines from his story. Professor Hishuram is very upset with us. We have published many articles about prehistoric animals but we have failed to acknowledge the strange hunting experiences. We agree this has been most unfair on our part. In fact, we did not know of hunting stories, but now Professor Hushiar has sent us some extracts from his hunting diaries. We have published some of these accounts. It is up to you to decide whether they are true or false. These lines opens up that's real and you know the real tragic tree that science fiction magazines undertook to disseminate science fiction you know within indian culture and indian cultural context we are told that this eponymous protagonist of the short story professor hishuram is angry because the stories have not been published the very mention of publishing draws us into the politics of print culture which was prominent both within us and india wherein you know anindita ghosh tells us that print culture emerged as central to the restructuring of the public imagination in 19th century colonial Bengal and the Hindi heartland. According to Anandita Ghosh, print language and literature played a vital role in shaping ideas and identities in Bengal from 18th century onwards. This verbalization of publishing points towards the politics of mass production, circulation and consumption of text, which is also in work found in US pulp science fiction magazine, more importantly, the articulation of publishing conceptualizes readers in conversation with and in negotiation with authors, texts, and multiple social registers. Hishuram's insistence on getting his work published and the embedded frame narrative for grounding the frame, the fictional editor publishers' actions to distance his establishment from any labels, blame game, and impending ruckus obliquely shifts the focus onto the reader or if we bring into play here, turns back fans, you know, fanzines. These two distinct characteristics, the need to be documented and the reader's importance outlines Hishuram's story's basic framework and also brings to the fore the value and the significance of the speculative imaginaries within the Indian context. In its figuration of the narrative voice, the second aspect pleased the owners of validating Hishuram's strange tale onto the reader and thereby encasing this text within a heterogeneous reading network, comprising a varied interpretative strategies that were in fashion during the last three decades of the 19th century to the first half of the 20th century span till the 1930s. The sheer fact that the fictional editor, publisher, embedded narrator of the Sage column added the lines regarding the veracity of Hishuram's expedition story, foregrounds active readers at the center of such stories and also suggests these readers have been granted the supreme authority to validate the expedition tales of Professor Hishuram. This brings us back to Gunspax's story wherein we are also told these readers emerged as crucial to reifying the stories and it creating the wonders, the technological mastery that 
American science fiction magazines, you know, endorsed. However, when we come back to the reading culture that was espoused in the Indian science fiction magazine, we will notice that these periodicals became the key site as Sampirta Mark Mitra stated of reshaping inner and outer domains of nationalistic space. More importantly, these periodicals confronted science as tools of imperialism in ways which made reading of these magazines direct us to the imagining of collective social polity. So while in you know, US, it was more about telling you know, what the, you know, the scientist, the engineer can you know, supposedly create within the Indian con consciousness, it became these periodicals opened up a Patok Samaj. Patok Samaj means you know, reader society that articulated a nationalistic space outside of legislations, authority, which characterized British colonial education. Reading modern literature, as Sampirta Mitra said, and also science fiction was very much a solitary quotidian practice. At the same time, it constituted a significant mode of public and collective engagement with profound implications for new visions of social change. Mitra's reading of Bengali periodicals locates them in a vortex of change and transformations, while change and transformation is also visible within the Indian uh, US public science, you know, pulp science fiction magazines. It is nowhere, you know, collective and political or, you know, transformative, which is very much visible within the uh, Indian science fiction context. And to say a little bit more, I am just going to give you an idea what this Professor Hesharam's diary was all about. Professor Hesharam's tale, you know, it's a strange tale wherein you will find the interplay of multiple genres like diary narratives, adventure stories, hunting expeditions, oral narratives, folklore, exploring traveling narratives, nonsense literature, parody, and children's literature. It comprises also embedded narratives, interviews, which you will find a lot many you know, genres also visible in the US pulp fiction magazines, though there, you know, Gunspack was always concerned about, you know, whether his, you know, stories were becoming bastardized. He was always concerned about defining the boundaries and making it, you know, completely, you know, relying on scientific fact. Wherein in here, the story is more, you know, like a kind of a dialectical kind of a terrain where all kinds of, you know, there's a diffusive disciplinary, interdisciplinary contacts being made. And this story, primarily the story tells us about this Professor Heshuram who wants to make his story published. And this Professor Heshuram is a scientist, come an explorer. And the story is divided into three sections. The first section of the story is comprising a frame narrative that functions also as an embedded commentary, wherein there is a shadow is cast over the truth claims of Professor Heshuram's narrative. The second section with its random fragmentary and strange adventures documented in a diary adds to a woes of ever extracting the truth of professors traveling tales. These diary extracts include the adventure stories as you know, exploring the Karakuram range and also a fictional you know, creation of a new site, new geography itself. These extracts spans 72 days of exploration expedition, but provides incomplete description of the multiple fantastic adventures and exploration to distant lands undertaken by Professor Hishuram and his crew. I'm going to you know, skip a few bit. As an element of travel narrative and expedition tales covering strange and dangerous adventures, this is almost equal, you know, similar to what you will find in many of the you know, early science fiction magazines that were being published in the US. Yet, the story that is being told tells us about these European surveyors, plant collectors, mineralogists, doctors, and engineers who were part of an important, you know, they were part of the company, the East India Company person, personal, who carried out surveys, created maps, established printing presses, and steam railways. And these were connected with actually um, founding the empire, the British Empire. They were crucial links engaged in empire building. However, when we read Professor's diary, we realize that these scientists, these engineers are very much far away from truth. Right, okay, Erika, I will try to complete it within that time. Hishunams' need to record his travels for posterity articulates not only the daring bravery of the colonizers and the scientific logic that underpins such hunting expedition, but also functions as evidences of the natives' lack of scientific knowledge and technological expertise, signaling the differences between colonizer and the colonized. So here it was more than social, it was a form of opening up a new kind of a political space. 
In this hunting expedition, Heshwaram and his crew encounter several animals who are named according to their physical characteristics, understood and defined by Bengali language, and subsequently the naming process is rendered complete by adding Latin suffixes. So the first animal Heshuram's crew encounter is Hangla Therium. Hangla in Bengali means hungry, and Therium is the Latin suffix. Then the next is, you know, Chilano Soros. Chilano is somebody who shouts and screams, and Soros is again a Latin suffix. Langla Therium, you know, the animal who is lame, and the Therium is the Latin suffix. The act of naming, classifying, you know, people, flora, and fauna is what which constitutes Professor Hishuram's scientific enterprise, and this was an integral part of the British administration. These technological conceptions of naming as DN Heath spelled out not only embodied new conceptions of space, time, and new understandings of economy, society, history, and progress, but also set about enumerating, demarcating, and classifying colonized people. However, what I would like to bring to point here is this association of the Bengali with the Latin suffixes. It actually opens up what Mary Louis Pratt had explained as the contact zone. Contact zone, as Louis Pratt explained, was an attempt to invoke the spatial and temporal co-presence of subjects previously separated by geographic and historical disjunctions and whose trajectories now intersect. By using the term contact, Mary Louis Pratt said, she aimed to foreground the interactive improvisational dimensions of colonial encounters so easily ignored or suppressed by diffusionist accounts of conquest and domination. A contact perspective emphasizes how subjects are constituted in and by their relations to each other. So Heshuram's convoluted expressions of vernacular Bangla and Latinate expressions with unprecedented vocabulary and idioms is cast, as I argue, in a series of displacement whose meanings are always deferred. What Gomra Therium, Bechara Therium, and other neologisms suggest are that the diffusionist model of George Besola's idea of science and linear modernity framework from West to non-West is wholly absurd and worse, factually incorrect. The drawing up of boundaries and the hardening of fluid identities, which Gernsback sought to do, followed by also by you know, uh, Campbell as well, is now shown to be as completely unscientific and which is neither a part of the indigenous culture nor a part of the Western modes of knowledge and they never offer the complete truth. Reading these you know, combination as assemblages of being Bangla and Latinate phrases, uh, what I would like to say that science and the idea of science that percolated in these Indian science fiction magazines redraws the politics of scientific modernity as emanating from the West or more precisely Britain. What it tries to suggest that science was always polycentric and multinodal, suggesting different power linkages. The globe, these adjectives suggest how multiple centers or nodes of power, there are multiple, not one. Positing different goals existing synchronically within a single time period fundamentally rewrites the deficientist meta-narrative of Western modernity. So to end, to conclude, Science fiction within the Indian science fiction magazines suggests a different kind of a mobility. A mobility that, you know, while it is complementary to US pulp fiction magazine in terms of, you know, describing the technological marvels and so on, it is also suggestive of a double movement that goes back and forth and which can be repeated indefinitely. In circulating things, men and notions often transform themselves, and science within the Indian science fiction magazines is a part of a circulation that implies an incremental aspect and not the simple reproduction across space of already formed structures and notions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Indrani. It was very interesting. So let's go to the next speaker, our last speaker, and then we uh, do the Q&A. So uh, our last speaker is Martin Butler with the paper of cultures and classes representing STEM education, science and academia in Showtime's Shameless from 2011 to 2021. Martin Butler is professor at the University of Oldenburg. His research focuses on American popular culture. His publications include a monograph on Woody Guthrie and nine co-edited essays collections, such as Resistance, Subjects, Representation and Context, published in 2017, and Precarious Alliance, 
cultures of participation in print and other media published in 2015. He works on the subproject Science on TV, representations of science and, and the scientists in the second golden age of television as part, as part of the research network Fictions Meets Science. So when you're ready, Martin, okay. the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope that you can see the slides now. Can you? Yes. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I my my talk is a bit off topic because I was moved uh, from another panel. I migrated, so to speak, from another panel. So thank you very much for your hospitality, which uh, which I very much appreciate, and I hope I can give you some insights into. STEM education and popular culture. So uh, for the US television series Shameless aired from 2011 to 2021 on Showtime, STEM education is certainly not a major concern. Set in the south side of Chicago, the series portrays the fates and fortunes of the members of the Gallagher family in 11 seasons spanning 134 episodes. In a working class context becoming increasingly gentrified over the course of the series, we witness the individual family members' trials and errors in finding their way in the poor and disenfranchised urban environment in which they are raised, which is characterized by drug addiction, crime, violence, and discriminations of many kinds. With a drug addicted and annoyingly self-centered father and the oldest daughter, Fiona, taking care of the other children, Lip, Ian, Debbie, Carl, and Liam, the family's life is indeed framed by the constant lack of financial and other resources. And daily routines revolve around finding ways to pay next month's rent and keeping Father Frank from making too much damage in one of his many excesses. That said, one might e indeed be tempted to add that inasmuch as Shameless portrays a working class environment, it also depicts those who do not even, even belong to this class. As Don Merson puts it, it is about the working class and the class below them. Shameless is really about the poor and many of the characters understand their place in the class system of modern day America. Shameless through its highly explicit verbal and visual ways of telling stories of the underprivileged thus unsettles the notion of the bourgeois nuclear family that other film and TV formats have regularly reproduced and in so doing can be understood as an extreme variation of the traditional family saga. Yet even if it's perhaps not a major concern, education does play a role in the series, more or less explicitly and more or less regularly. And more often than not, it is made relevant in discussions about access and participation in the institutionalized forms and formats of learning and vocational qualification. This way, the series links formal education to tales of upward social mobility, which quite frequently, however, are debunked as mere tales at the very moment they take shape. For instance, when the youngest son of the Gallagher family, Liam, is accepted as a Black American at a private school in one of the richer and whiter neighborhoods, it is not for his talent or intellect, but for reasons of political correctness and affirmative action. He's being permitted to take part in classes at that school then is not supposed to move him towards higher ranks, but to consolidate the white privilege of education through the incorporation of the underprivileged other. The school, as Don Merson has it, is using Liam as a marketing device to new families, and that is the price for his tuition. When he returns to his family neighborhood, his education actually appears to be a miseducation as he cannot transfer his skills and knowledge to his family context. This way then the serious take on education and the educational system is at least twofold. On the one hand, access to education is still considered to be a way out of poverty, even though hard labor and more so criminal activities are equally acknowledged as such. On the other hand, the series develops a critical stance towards the promise of social mobility through education, as it emphasizes the role of educational institutions in the stabilization of racial and social demarcation lines. 
This ambivalent position towards education and STEM education in particular is articulated in the story of the family's oldest son, Philip or Lip Gallagher, whose intellectual abilities are far beyond any of his siblings and who is thus torn between the aspiration of an academic career and the working class environment he is set in the first five season, uh, set in in the first five seasons of the series. Indeed, as Payet and Akbar have shown in their analysis of the character, Lip can be read as the model type of the underclass but gifted young adult forced to navigate between different worlds and their established practices and habitus. With his talent being discovered as he is caught in the act cheating for one of his classmates. His educational career in the field of STEM starts with an incidental encounter, not as part and parcel of a strategy. Somewhat unwillingly at first, Lip decides to submit applications to universities, is accepted by a considerable number of them, but decides to go to his local institution, Chicago Polytechnic University. In the course of his studies, however, and despite being financed through scholarship, Lip runs into a range of problems originating from his socialization in the urban ghetto of Chicago, including first and foremost, his addiction to alcohol, which keeps him from fulfilling his academic duties and significantly contributes to his failure. Payet and Akbar in their sociological study of shameless and social class indeed use Lip as a case study that illustrates that and how US American institutions of higher education, especially in the field of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, are still not aware enough of the significance of their students' socioeconomic backgrounds for their study path. Concluding that programs of support would be needed for those who come from underprivileged contexts, they write of the ever-present reality that social class remains a significant obstacle to enrolling in staying in and graduating from college. Indeed, both structured by and reproducing socioeconomic stratification, STEM education in the US more often than not still excludes those youth whose family backgrounds do not provide them with adequate educational and economic resources to pass the entry level requirements of college or university careers. Despite attempts at increasing options of including the socioeconomically disadvantaged in what is often referred to as the STEM pipeline, the gatekeeping mechanisms defining the field of science and its central institution, that is the university, persist and contribute to maintaining a class-based structure of access and achievement. Whereas Payet and Akbar draw attention to this mechanism of class reproduction, their argument does not at all question the institution of science and STEM education in principle. Quite the contrary. They argue for support structures that help include people like Lip Gallagher and make them fit for higher education, the value of which, as a prerequisite for a successful life, remains undoubted. And don't get me wrong here, I agree that higher education in the field of STEM should be more inclusive. And of course, there is little doubt that enabling people to study at a university does enhance their chances in life. Yet, Inasmuch as Shameless repeats the criticism of STEM education as an exclusive terrain for the privileged, the series also, and perhaps more importantly, questions the oftentimes unquestioned belief in the institution of academia and the career paths it offers. In other words, I believe that the show goes beyond a mere showcasing of the reproduction of class through and in STEM education. Rather, I argue that the show tells the story of Lip's failure as one that is also driven by critical reflection, both his and the serious critical reflection about institutionalized science. To be precise, there is more at stake in the series than just the portrayal of a sociologically relevant case. The constant questioning of the institution of science indeed is part and parcel of Lip's university career triggered first and foremost through his acquaintance with one of his teachers, Clyde Ewens, a professor of engineering who becomes Lip Gallagher's mentor. Ewens is convinced of Lip's talent, but just like Lip's father, Frank, and Lip himself has been suffering from alcoholism, which in turn makes him susceptible to Lip's own drinking problem. Ewens then takes care of Lip both academically and as a friend, trying to make sure that Lip stays on track. 
At the same time, lived through Ewens learns that the institution of academia is governed by its own system of acknowledgments and sanctioning, which puts its protagonists under enormous pressure and gives shape to a highly ritualized and formalized form of teaching and learning based upon deeply hierarchical structures. In the end then, it is these structures which make Lip become aware that his idea or ideal of science as unfettered search for the truth does not become manifest. Rather, is he confronted with the exclusionary and regulating mechanisms of a system that does not produce heroic scientists and discoverers, but reproduces the institutional hierarchy and in the worst case, leaves behind deeply frustrated professors such as Yuen's whose alcoholism eventually results in a car accident as a consequence of which Lip mentors, Lip's mentor has to go to prison. Scientists, as Lip learns, are not at all heroic but tragic figures. And their stories are not necessarily far from those that he knows from his neighborhood. Quite the contrary, their private vices make them accessible and vulnerable at the same time, which add to Lip's growing skepticism of the institution of science. As a socially underprivileged but somehow gifted as an adolescent, Lip is thus turned into the non-academic other who becomes the subject of pedagogical intervention. This process of othering, however, the awareness of which fosters Lip's unease with the institution does not only take place in the field of science and technology, but is also at work in his experience with the humanities. There, however, Lip's status as the underclass outcast does not trigger a pedagogical intervention. Rather, does it lead to a sexual relationship with one of his philosophy teachers, Helene Runyon, who feels attracted to him as we may assume exactly because of his being an academic misfit whose behavior is not at all in line with the established habitus of the university. It perhaps does not come as a surprise that in contrast to the protagonists of STEM education, the humanities are represented by a female professor, a professor whose libido is put center stage right from the very first meeting with Lip, who as we learn becomes one of her numerous love affairs that her husband allows her to have. The occasional discussions between Runyon and Lip about literature and its theories, mostly by a French post-structuralist thinkers, by the way, adds to the feminization or eroticization of the study of philosophy. Indeed, whereas Lip's fascination for engineering and mathematics is clearly coded in terms of the heroic endeavor to solving complex problems at the frontiers of knowledge, and thus framed by a gesture of masculinity, his relationship with Runyon is characterized primarily by bodily affection, paired with or initiated by intellectual stimuli, the exchange of which may well be considered a foreplay to their erotic encounters. The very moment Runyon and Lip start their relationship, we know that it will fail, and it fails dramatically. For Lip, as he is trapped by his emotional attachment to Runyon and out of desperation, starts to drink again and gives in to his addiction when Runyon drops him, as, he has, as she has probably dropped others before. And it fails for Runyon too, who is sanctioned by the institution, as a photo of one of her encounters with Lip goes viral and ruins her career. Embedded in this feminizing depiction of the humanities, Lip's encounter with Runyon on the one hand indeed adds to the serious portrayal of the field of science, technology, and engineering as their masculine counterpart. Through this gendering of academia, then, the series reproduces the idea of two cultures that C.P. Snow introduced to the debate on the relationship between science and the humanities already in 1959. An idea which ever since then has not lost too much of its significance in university practices and politics. On the other hand, the affair with Runyon and its tragic end contribute to the portrayal of academia as a highly regulated system of acknowledgement and sanctioning on different levels in which relationships come and go and are in most cases not at all reliable. The story about Runyon and Lip then draws our attention to what sociologist Mark Ranovetter has called the weakness and strength of social ties, a topic which also plays a central role in the serious depiction of Lip's university career and failure. 
For Lip, it seems Granovetter's formula that weak ties matter as they widen social contact zones and possibilities of interaction does not necessarily apply. Sure, it is Ewan's that helps him to get over his addiction, at least temporarily, and puts a lot of effort into supporting Lip as a student. Yet, both the relationship to Ewan's and to Runyon as Lip's mentors are characterized by fragility, framed by the written and unwritten rules and regulations of academia. Casting doubt on the significance of weak ties, at least for Lip Gallagher, Shameless also calls into question the narrative of formal education as a door opening device so central to the plot of the Bildungsroman and contrasts it with other informal but apparently more effective contexts of learning, which teach lessons that might be of equal importance for the unfolding of Lip's subjectivity. To be precise, his dysfunctional family and his rundown neighborhood paradoxically provide the strong ties that serve as a reliable network for Lip to resort to in precarious times. To be sure the families and neighbors are there just because they have no options of mobility. It would thus be misleading to romanticize the hood of the South Side as a refuge for failed academics. Yet David Krakard in his discussion of Granovetter's concepts argues that the strength of strong ties must not be underestimated. He points out that Granovetter himself admitted that strong ties are more likely to be useful to the individual when that individual is, is, is in an insecure position. Especially when it comes to processes of transition and change, as Krakard observes, it requires trust on the basis of strong, effective, and time-honored relationships. This story, then, of strong ties and trust as another quintessential ingredient of one's Bildung education is what Shameless manages to add to its critical representation of academic STEM education, the field of science, and the institution of the university. So whereas Shameless criticizes the class-related modes of distinction and exclusion of STEM education and negotiates cliched variations of academia and the professor as its major protagonist, it also addresses the complex processes of habitualization in the formation of one's identity in and beyond the institution of science. The series then makes us aware that in the process of becoming ourselves, formal education is not necessarily sensitive to individual aspirations and alternatives ideas of what constitutes a good life. That's it for me. Thank you uh, very much. Okay, thank you very much, Martin. Okay, so Indrani and Lucia, you can turn your camera and your mic on. And if you, if the rest of the audience have any question or anything, you can click on the reaction button or uh, post your questions on the chat. So uh, meanwhile, I have a general question that I uh, that I can think because I see that there are some common elements like the othering and the the way of creating. Uh... Okay, Indrani has uh, having problems, so I'm going to say the question and then uh, Indrani, if you if you can't oh, um, turn your camera. Own, please uh, turn your Actually, mic on. My video has been stopped by the host. So the host okay. needs to open my video. I can't do it. Okay. It's saying you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Okay, now I can do it. Okay, now, okay. So um, uh, regarding, for example, the, um, the COVID, how do you think, for example, um, how is influenced this kind of ideas where different, uh, for example, in your in your case, Lucia, when we talk about um, um, a refugee, we have different images because I don't know, for example, in the book, if there are more characters related to this uh, identity, and um, if you can see differences and. As uh, and if you think this kind of um, ordering 
has another influence depending on not only gender or class, but also even age or the, the regarding uh, post-colonial identities, the country of origin. So that's my question. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, well, regarding the first part of your question, um, there aren't any other characters that um, come from any other countries that I know of. I mean, it's not specified. The, the main character, she's black, she's from Algerian originally, and um, there are no other characters that are black, there are no other characters um, that are othered in the same way she is. So it's, that's where the, the role of the reader that I was talking about um, before comes in, because it's really important how, you know, it's just this white gaze, or at least maybe not white, but just American gaze on this, you know, refugee in Algerian, um, person who's supposed to be invisible, who's supposed to be vulnerable, and who nevertheless is standing out because she is happy when she supposedly should not be happy. Um, there are other aspects that do um, come in, um, in analysis as well. I couldn't talk about them because of time as well, of course, but um, not regarding age specifically, it's more about um, gender. Um, because as an Oriental other, Tassa is, um, you know, being a woman really influences um, the gaze of the male characters in the novel. She's also sexually assaulted. And this is where you can, you know, this is a climax of the novel. You can see where all the different factors where she's being you know, consumed by everybody else um, come in. And um, yeah, I think, yeah, of course I had to, uh, to focus my of course, on only one aspect, and that's where the, the, the post-colonial approach comes in and all you know, the ethics of hospitality and regarding um, the stranger as somebody you know or somebody you want to welcome to your home. And, to, you know, Tassa, in the book, she has a lot of friends. She has lots of people who um, apparently, or at least initially, try, try to welcome her, try to encourage her. But is this constant difference that I think is um, emphasized um, through Power's narration that makes us um, readers aware of all of these different layers that are going on. So, um, Martin, I have another question for you, if you okay. want. Okay, you because might. I... I was wondering if, for example, these differences between philosophy, as you said, as, um, and science, is reflected in the in the family in the family depiction because I have, I have never seen the the TV series so I don't know if it is only for high education higher education or in general. Well, I, I wouldn't say that it's reflected in, 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 in the family. Uh, what is reflected in the family is a general distrust in, in formal education and especially in higher education because the, the esteem or the, the idea that you would uh, follow a career, a university career, and then uh, you would be moving upwards socially is not an idea that is that is an established idea in the south side of Chicago, where you would um, rather go for something that is more, you know, related to vocational training and 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 other forms of of, of manual or hard labor. So I think the academia or the the institution of science is very far away from 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 where the family comes from and lives. So that that makes it difficult uh, for the character of Lip to navigate between these two worlds. And, because he's, you know, not used to the the habitualized forms of, of of academic practice, and that is why he eventually fails uh, because he he cannot accommodate. And as soon as he accommodates, he comes back to his family and is no longer able to to read the, the family and and how the family maneuvers life. So it's a it's a kind of schizophrenic experience which makes him uh, resort to to, to, to alcoholism once again. And the, the series, I think, manages, uh, cleverly manages to stage his, his habitus, that is the, the embodied practice of his 
of his class specific environment as something that that really keeps him away from from uh, from straightforwardly following the university career. I, I was I was raising my finger. If you if you allow, I would have another question for uh, for Lu Lucia, <laughs> if I may. I mean, uh, um, because you were you were talking about the gaze, the colonial uh, or post colonial gaze of so many different instances. Have you? I mean, of, of course, I'm sure you have. Have you also considered to um, to reflect on the author's position in the U.S. American book market and his, you know, giving voice to a topic that 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 that, that speaks for uh, other people's uh, perspectives and lives? I mean, Richard Powers is a very well esteemed author, and he's white and male, and he's now giving voice to you know, this, this post-colonial narrative of, of, of identity formation and othering. So in how far does that play a role in your, in your research, that this um, giving a voice to somebody who is probably not able to speak in the way that Richard Powers would be considering his position in the book market? Th that would be interesting to, to hear about. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Yes, of course, I... Um, I thought about it a lot at the beginning. I mean, um, Richard Powers is a it's heterosexual white man um, speaking or giving voice to an Algerian refugee and um, giving voice to, yeah, as you say, people that... Sorry. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't really... I mean, in my analysis, I, of course, try to separate the voice of the author and the voice of the narrator because it's two completely, of course, different um, voices. But I did, I did think, I do think it's a complicated question. But um, it's a question that we all ask. I mean, I, you can't say um, this person does not have a right to um, give voice to these other people, and he is raising awareness of not really as much as um, task suspect. As I said, um, the novel is not focalised through, it's focalised through all the other um, white characters. So what he is, um, I think, raising awareness is of, of the fact of our positions, um, our perceptions, our constructions of identities that are not our own. And thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there are two people who want to ask. So Anna, if you want, you can ask. Yes, um, I was just wondering uh, for Martin, um, I, I thought that it was very interesting. I haven't watched the series, but it's kind of intriguing. And especially, you know, as lately there's been this hype before uh, the chair that I haven't watched either. But this one sounds kind of like more interesting in a way and more articulated and layered about uh, the construction of academia. Uh, I was just wondering, as, it's, as it was very, very interesting what you were saying that it, it creates this opposition between that, that exists in real life between formal education and what is academia and the outside world that often, you know, it's a bit, uh, academics often live in a bubble in a way and they don't realize that there's something outside, but this outside, some, sometimes it's um, a good support uh, as it happens in a way for, for the character you're talking about. Um, and it feels like in academia, there's no safety net. If you fall, you're falling in a way. So I was wondering in the series, uh, what's good about academia? Is there, is there anything good about uh, STEM education and academia in this series? I mean, what is um, something that might tell the viewer, yeah, this is a bit, uh, you know, messed up, but still there are some good things about it and, you know, productive and enriching and so on. Yeah, I mean, uh... The, the first of all, the, the just just a comment on the chair. Uh, this series is, is more of a pastiche version of an English literature department, which which is not which is different from Shameless because it's not so seriously um, 
discussing the complexities of, 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 of institutionalized education. And STEM does so, uh, uh, Shameless does so from a distinctly social class oriented point of view, which, which makes this um, a, a, a paradox narrative in the sense that on the one hand, of course, Lib is able to take part in university education. There are moments in which he gets the chance and the opportunity to use the, the, the formalized context of, 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 of university education. And, and the, the shame is that he doesn't make use of this properly. Um, and that's at the same time, the moment that you start to reflect on, well, what does that mean to, to make use of that properly? What's the right way of behaving? What are the ideas of science and academia that people who are not grown up in, in you know, these contexts, bourgeois contexts, what's their idea about academia and science? And you see these ideas um, uh, um, colliding with what, um, with what he experiences at, at the academic institution where he sees characters fail um, on a different level, but they still fail. So they are tragic professors in a way, in, in multiple ways. One on, on this, you know, uh, constantly having affairs with one's students and the other is being an alcoholic that is completely frustrated because as we, as we feel, he has not got the position that he thinks he should have gotten in his lifetime. So he, what, what Lip witnesses are, it is a failure of himself and of, of, of the, the people that he meets. meets. On the other hand, I would say, yes, there are moments in which we see how the gatekeeping mechanisms are broken up by his being, well, put on, on a scholarship, for instance, and being able to, to, to get to, uh, to these uh, contexts of education. So it's, a, it's, it's an ambivalent portrayal. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, I mean, I, I would say that part of the gatekeeping is indeed um, inherent to the fact that you're supposed to behave in a certain way to to take advantage of it, to take advantage and, and get benefit from the good side of, of academia. And if you cannot, for whatever reason, follow this path and behave in that way and abide by certain rules, then you're anyway going to fail somehow whether you're the student or, or the professor, I guess. Okay, so the next question is uh, from Michael. Michael? Thank you. Um, just quickly chiming in because since Anna and Martin already raised the uh, chair, <laughs> was of course also something that came across my mind when you were talking, Martin. Uh, and just to, to sort of add to your uh, 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 thought on uh, on uh, shameless, nevertheless, kind of painting a little bit more of a complex image of academia than probably the chair does. Uh, it's also interesting how, in shameless, you get the you get these images of um, of the hierarchies and also processes of exploitation within the academy. Within just a couple of scenes, where you have you know the TAs doing the work and the profs basically just exploiting them at the end of the day, and in the chair, uh, the series. Uh, neatly ignores the identification, for example, of you as academia and all that stuff. So, um, yeah. But I actually wanted to ask a question to 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 uh, Indrani, um, who turned off her camera again. <laughs> um, since you so neatly uh, detailed the uh, linkages and also more actually the differences between uh, science fiction in the early 20th century or late 19th, early 20th century in India versus the US. Um, I was one, uh, thinking about one thing that Jerry so neatly stressed in his keynote or key discussion, whatever you want to call it, the other day, namely that at the end of the day, you could argue that the American national um, mode of storytelling is very much science fictional. Um, in how far does it potentially also apply to India in a certain way, or how would you describe the national storytelling tradition of India? And I think I've read something by Bodhi uh, about that in a certain way that they touched on that somewhere. But if you could comment on that, maybe. 
Yeah, thank you, Michael, for this question. Well, frankly speaking, when we think about, you know, Indian science fiction, you know, it's actually by, you know, by writers like even Bodhi and, you know, Alan Menon and Vandana Singh, you know, all of those major writers who are, you know, working, you know, really well and have written fascinating stories, they all actually are very wary of the term Indian science fiction. The first thing for us, the definitional marker, you know, somehow, you know, literally they want to stay away from it. Like, you know, why do we, you know, mention it as Indian science fiction? They're also not really keen on using speculative imaginary. So you have a Bodhi who came up with the term of Kolpo Bigyan. So Kolpo means imagination, where science itself functions as imagination. So wherein, you know, have different kinds of definitional constructs, but when you come to Indian science fiction as a nationalistic space, you will find, you know, new stories that are being written like Samit Basu's, you know, the new story, Chosen Spirits, and even Gautam Bhati as The Wall, you know, the first, you know, trilogy which is coming out, which has come out in 2019. And here he is describing a kind of a nationalistic space which very much mirrors our, you know, present. The kind of stories that are emerging now are the stories that somehow do not seek the future. The future is here in the now, and the here in the now, there is no way out, absolutely. That's the first kind of thing that you notice. The second thing that you want to notice about these stories that are now coming out, that are now being published, and which, you know, somehow also links with the stories like, you know, Sukumar Ray and his, you know, son wrote, you know, Satyajit Ray wrote in the Professor Shonko series, you will find, you know, there is a sense of, you know, trying to grapple with the idea of post-nationalism and post-colonialism. How do we, you know, actually envisage a kind of a post-colonialism that speaks for all of us, somehow or the other, it speaks for at least for us, and rather not, you know, speaking in some sort of a universalizing strain, not in some type of a oneness or a sameness, but it tries to actually grapple with the dialectics of the local with the global. It's a conversational. So most of the stories that you will find in within the Indian science fictional terrain is one which never ends. We are always in the process of being somewhere and, you know, talking somewhere and engaging in a kind of a dialogue. So when you're dealing with Indian science fiction terrains, I would like to use a sort of a tradition which is followed by most of the writers now. And this is a tra tradition of, you know, the st storytelling, a kind of a storytelling which you will find also mirrored in the South Asian network, the whole framework. So you have a street in Peshawar where each and every person every morning tells a story to another person, somewhere, you know, someone whom he meets. That person, you know, tells the story in a different way. This is one way to relate to Indian science fiction stories, you know, where Indian science fiction stories connects with the past, but at the same time, it's opening up new possibilities. I hope I have answered your question, Michael. Thank you. Okay, I don't know if there's any other question from the audience. Okay, so if you don't have any other question, thank you for being here for this amazing panel. Thank you, thank you to you, uh, the panelists, because your panel, your papers were great, and um, thank you to the audience for being here. And as you may know, there are other panels and keynotes that are really interesting. So thank you.